A warm welcome to everybody who has come here this evening for our Ash Wednesday evening service. We begin our worship by singing the opening hymn, Sunday's Palms are Wednesday's Ashes. It's found printed in the bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God created us to know joy in communion with him, to love all humanity, and to live in harmony with all creation. But sin separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation, and so we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended for us. <coughs> By our sin we grieve our Father, who does not desire us to come under his judgment, but to turn to him and live. Therefore God, in his mercy, has sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take our place under the law, to suffer for us, and to die the death we deserve. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. During the 40 days of Lent, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, 
scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. The time of Lent reminds us that to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, we must also know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. As disciples of the Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to confess your sins, ask our Father in heaven for forgiveness, and commit yourselves to this struggle. Let us be silent, let us be still, let us pause now for a time of reflection and self-examination. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned by our own fault, by our own grievous fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, Lord. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, Lord. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the past pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. We confess to you, O Lord. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways, our manipulation of other people, we confess to you, O Lord. Our anger when our selfish aims are denied and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves, we confess to you, O Lord. Our love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work, we confess to you, O Lord. Our negligence in worship and prayer and our failure to show the faith that is in us, we confess to you, O Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Forgive us, O Lord. For all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward others, and for our prejudice and contempt for those who differ from us. Forgive us, O Lord. For what we think or say or do that is at variance with your will, Forgive us, O Lord. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Hear Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. For those who desire the imposition of ashes, you can make a line up the center aisle. And uh, 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 for those who desire... Remember, from dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Remember, from dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Remember, from dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Remember, from dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Remember, from dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Remember that from dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Remember that from dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Remember that from dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Remember.
remember that from dust you are, and that to dust you shall return. Remember that from dust you are, and that to dust you shall return. Remember that from dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of salvation. By the cross and suffering of your Son, O Lord, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. Therefore, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. During these days of Lent, let us implore God to give us renewal and his Holy Spirit. May we continue to abide in true faith and at the last be received by him through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you despise nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all who repent. Create in us new and contrite hearts, that lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, we may receive from you, the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. first appointed reading for Ash Wednesday is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, beginning at verse 12. For our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities, rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, inciting revolt and oppression, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth is stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west, people will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory, for he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. Here ends the first scripture lesson. The psalm for this evening is the penitential psalm, Psalm 51a. We have a hymn version of that psalm that we will sing. It's printed in the book.
second lesson is the epistle lesson from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here ends the second scripture lesson. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, beginning at verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Here ends the Holy Gospel. We continue by singing the Hymn of the Evening, Hymn 738. It's in the Christian Worship Supplement book. You may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for this evening is recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verses 3 and 4. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. Here we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, during this Lenten season, we're going to make use of the theme, The Critical Hours. And in our text, we uh, learn about one of those critical hours, critical moments in the Passion history. This moment involves Judas. Judas was the only disciple of Jesus to come from Judea. He's called Judas Iscariot. The word Iscariot means from Kirioth. Kirioth was a village that was south of Jerusalem. Judas was handpicked by Jesus to follow him for three years and learn of him and be his disciple. And during that period of time, Judas, along with the other 11, was sent out on a short missionary journey and told to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God was at hand. And Judas and the other 11 were given power by God to cast out demons and to heal people. Jesus told them, you know, you, you have freely received these gifts. Now freely give them away. But that was not exactly Judas' agenda. Judas was out to make as much money as he possibly could. So, that approach, freely giving, not consistent with Judas' agenda. And I think the turning point for Judas came when Jesus was in Bethany. And Mary came in and anointed him with costly perfume ahead of time for his burial. When Judas saw that, he said, hmm, why this waste? He claimed that that perfume could have been sold and the money given to the poor. But the Bible tells us that he didn't care a lick about the poor. Instead, he was a thief. He carried the money bag. He was the treasurer for the group. And he embezzled money from that treasury. After being rebuked by Jesus, we learn that Satan entered him. I don't think Satan had a very hard time. He didn't have to kick down the door or chop it down with an axe. I think Judas was a willing accomplice with Satan. Well, anyway, the devil prompted him to go to the chief priests and the elders and to ask them, what will you give me if I hand him over to you? And so Judas became the betrayer. But what does that mean exactly, to betray? In Luther's explanation of the Eighth Commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, he writes, we should fear and love God that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, or give him a bad name. To betray means to tell somebody's secret. And that's what Judas did. Jesus had a secret, a place he liked to hang out when he was visiting Jerusalem. He liked to camp there. He liked to spend time with his disciples there. It was the Garden of Gethsemane, and some believe that there was a cave there that served as shelter for Jesus and the disciples when they were in the garden. Well, G Judas knew about Jesus' secret, and he was willing to tell others Jesus' secret and thus betray him. And of course, this is exactly what Judas did. And after he did it, our text says he was seized with remorse. Now, I pray you've never been seized 
with remorse. But tonight would be as good a time as any for us to learn what to do when seized with remorse. First of all, let's take a look at exactly what is remorse. Well, Judas, when he was identified publicly by Jesus as the betrayer in the upper room, Judas departed. The other disciples weren't exactly aware of what was going on. They assumed he was going to give a gift uh, to the poor from the treasury. As Judas is walking out the door, Jesus says to him, what you are about to do, do quickly. In other words, you need to act according to my timetable, Judas, and not according to yours. And so Judas fulfilled his end of the bargain. He led a detachment of soldiers to the garden. He went up to Jesus and ID'd him with a kiss. And then he watched as Jesus was bound and led off to the high priest's palace. After that, after the Sanhedrin had their hearing and their trial and they condemned Jesus to death, somehow Judas heard about this. And so after being condemned by the Sanhedrin, but before Jesus was transported to the Praetorium to stand before Pilate, first thing in the morning on Friday, Judas decided that he was going to go and talk to the chief priests and the elders, those guys who had hired him to do this betraying. Can you imagine? He's going to the very building where Jesus is being held as a prisoner. Now, what what did Judas think was going to happen? I mean, did he think they were just going to arrest Jesus and then maybe uh, chew him out and threaten him and maybe rough him up a little bit, you know, and then send him on his way? Or did he think that surely Jesus would use his almighty power, power that Judas had seen on display for the last three years, and free himself? But why would he do that? He'd been telling the disciples all along that he was going to be handed over to wicked men and crucified, but then rise again on the third day. Well, whatever the case, we're told that Judas was now filled with remorse. But remorse is not repentance. Remorse is regret. Remorse means that Judas rued his action. Remorse means that he wanted to undo the mess that he made. He dreaded now the consequences of his actions. Uh Uh-oh, he thought, this is not what I thought was going to happen to Jesus. It's so sad, isn't it? Judas' love for Jesus turned into hatred for him, but it wasn't that murderous kind of hatred. Judas truthfully states before the chief priests and the elders, I have betrayed innocent blood. Those are not words of repentance. Judas doesn't say, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against Jesus. Judas doesn't say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. God be merciful to me, a betrayer. No, he's just upset about the mess that he has made. But you know what? You can't turn the clock back. What's done is done. This was a sin that was committed with his eyes wide open. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he felt justified in doing it. After all, Jesus chewed me out publicly in that home in Bethany, and now it was time for payback. And if he got a little pay on the side, you know, all the better. Well, where Judas was, filled with remorse, is exactly where Satan would like to get you. Satan, the destroyer, will try to lead you to exactly, to do exactly what you have set your heart on doing. Hurting someone else. Betraying a friend. And then once you have done that, he will turn right around and declare to you, you sinner, there's no forgiveness for that awful, horrible sin. 
For Judas, of course, it had to do with money, and I think for most people it has to do with money. There is that false belief that if you just get a bunch of money, your life is going to be happy. That, that empty hole is going to be filled. If you just get enough money, you're going to be made complete. And we, like Judas, are led to focus on just one thing with a laser focus, intent on getting that one thing done. And then when it finally gets done, we think we'll be happy but we're not. And then Satan comes around and asks, how could you have done that? How could you betray the one who called you, who loved you so dearly, the one who washed you in the water of baptism, the one who has given you responsibilities in this life? Oh my goodness, there is absolutely no hope for you at all. And then you, like Judas, will be filled with remorse. But what do you do? I think, first of all, understand this. Remorse, being upset that you've made a mess, is not repentance. Paul calls it worldly sorrow. Understand that those who are filled with remorse are easy prey for the devil, who wants to destroy you both body and soul in hell. All right, now let's consider what to do. Well, first from Judas, let's learn what not to do. What did Judas try to do? He tried to fix things, to undo what he had done. He had buyer's remorse, or you might say he had seller's remorse. Judas goes to the chief priests, the elders. He has money in hand. Did he think that by returning the money to them, that they would then say, oh, okay, we got our money, and now here's Jesus in return. Did he actually think that that was going to happen? If he did, he was sadly mistaken. The chief priests and the elders had used Judas, and now they had no use for him at all or for his bag of money. And if Judas went to them hoping for some kind of absolution, for forgiveness, as he declared that he had sinned, well, he was... Sadly mistaken, these men didn't have a spiritual bone in their body. Instead, they chuckled and they said, well, what is that to us? You betrayed innocent blood, what, what, who cares? What is that to us? That's your responsibility. That's your problem. And it was. It was the problem of Judas that he could not undo. And now this thing that meant so much to him, that was so precious to him, this money, now it became detestable and abhorrent, and he tossed it into the temple. But even as he did that, he could not rid himself of his remorse. And Satan was right there whispering, there's only one answer, Judas. You have to end it all. And that's exactly what he did. I suppose it's human nature, isn't it, to try to fix things? In the uh, program, Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a 12-step program, and steps number eight and nine talk about the recovering alcoholic doing their best to make amends. And we might think, yeah, well, yeah, that, that's a biblical thing, isn't it? Well, and yes and no. In the Old Testament, you know, if you were guilty of stealing, the civil law said you had to repay what you stole and then, you know, add a little bit extra to it for the person's trouble. But when John the Baptist said, produce fruit in keeping with repentance, the stress is on the repentance part. There is no fruit, there is no fix apart from repentance. So when seized with remorse, you might do well to ask yourself some important questions. Is this remorse? Am I just remorseful about the mess that I have made, or am I sorry for my sin? Am I sorry that I have sinned against heaven and against someone else on this earth? Am I acknowledging that my biggest mess is not the one that I made here on this earth, but my biggest mess is that I've ruined my relationship with God because of my sin. Stop trying to fix things that can't 
be fixed and repent. Start believing that that blood that Judas talked about, you know, that innocent blood has the power to wash away sin. Believe that someone besides the high priests bought somebody and that someone who did the buying is Jesus and the someone that he bought would be you and me, but not with silver, 30 pieces of silver. Instead, with his precious blood, as Peter writes, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. That's how Jesus bought you, and the buyer has no buyer's remorse. I guess when you think about Judas, uh, you see the comparison and contrast to his remorse when you look at Peter. You know, the two disciples sinned grievously. Some would say Peter was a worse sinner. I mean, Jesus had warned him about denying him and told him Satan is desiring to sift you like wheat, Peter. Peter's like, eh, I'll die with you, Lord. I'll never, I'll never deny you. And yet he did exactly that, and he did it three times. And then he heard the rooster crow, and somehow at the high priest's uh, palace, Peter was able to lock eyes with Jesus, and he remembered what Jesus had told him. But instead of being filled with remorse, Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter repented. Peter believed that despite his grievous sin, there was still forgiveness for him from his Savior. And Peter was not disappointed. Now, I know on Ash Wednesday evening, as we start another season of Lent, to hear about this story of, and this man named Judas, probably rather distasteful. People would rather hear about somebody else than, than Judas, the betrayer. My goodness, nobody names their kid Judas. And if somebody does some betraying, they're called a Judas, right? But we can learn some important truths from his sad example about what to do when filled with remorse. If you're filled with remorse, are you just upset about the mess that you have made, or are you genuinely sorry for your sin? Are you busy, busy trying to fix things instead of primarily worrying about the ruined relationship between you and God, a relationship that can only be healed by the blood of Christ? Instead of being filled with remorse. Repent. And trust no matter how awful that sin, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, purifies us from all of our sin. Ultimately, really, it is what Judas talked about in front of the high priest. Innocent blood poured out for you to wash away your sin, to wash away the sin of the world. Amen. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We worship God with our offerings.
Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, Christ, graciously hear us. O God, the Father in heaven, O God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, O God, the Holy Spirit, have, have mercy, mercy upon us. us. O God, who takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live, who called Adam and Eve after their fall to the acknowledgement of their fault and to true repentance, who forgave the sins of your disobedient people at the prayers of Moses, who put away David's transgression when he confessed and repented of his sin, who spared the Ninevites when they repented in sackcloth and with fasting, who came into the world to save sinners, who received tax collectors and sinners and ate with them, who forgave the many sins of Mary Magdalene, who in mercy looked upon Peter, who denied you, who moved him to confess his fault and to shed tears of penitence, who on the cross promised paradise to the penitent thief, who bore our sins in your own body on the tree, who was bruised for our iniquities, who gives time and place for the repentance of our sins, who rebukes and chastens those whom you love, who is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, who came to seek and to save the lost, who after true repentance remembers our sins no more, be gracious and spare us, O Lord, from all evil, from all sin, from a sudden and wicked death, by your baptism and your holy fasting, by your toils and griefs, by your blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, in the day of tribulation and anguish, and of your awful judgment, good Lord, Lord. We sinners ask you to hear us, that it may please you to bring us to true repentance, that condemning ourselves we may escape condemnation, that we may in due time bring forth worthy fruit of repentance, that as we have let our bodies and our minds become servants of uncleanness and sin, so we may now yield them to you as servants of righteousness and holiness, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we may live sober, righteous, and godly lives that we may exercise self-control on our bodies and bring them into submission to your will, that sin may not be our master, that we do not let ourselves be instruments of unrighteousness, that as true members of the body of Christ we crucify our flesh with its passions and lusts, that all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away from us, that we may never despise the riches of your goodness, patience, and long-suffering, that we may count all things as lost but for Christ, that being dead to sin we may live to righteousness, that through the many tribulations of this world you would grant us entrance into the kingdom of God, that it may please you graciously to hear us. O Son of God, we ask you to hear us. O Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, spare us, O Lord. O Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Yet even in ashes and dust there is hope, marked with the sign of the cross in our baptism and bearing the good fruit of repentance and faith. We pray you not to forsake your children, but to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that the words which we have spoken may be accompanied by actions of faith and repentance now and throughout this holy season of Lent, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn 405 in the blue hymnal.
evening. evening. Warm welcome to our visitors this evening, Clarence. There are a few announcements. There's still coffee and cake after the service. The church council is scheduled to have a brief uh, meeting, uh, monthly church council meeting. And uh, we're going to keep on working on those gift bags as we did tonight before the service, half hour before the Lenten service, uh, each and every Wednesday. Uh, next week, uh, Pastor Jacob Shepard, who was installed at St. Paul's in Round Lake, is going to be the guest uh, preacher. So uh, he will be preaching on the theme of part for the whole. Those are the announcements. 